today we're going to start the important thing. <laughs> this is what we're mostly going to use. Um, let me just define it quickly for you. A series is the sum of the terms of a sequence. Um, that's pretty much, that's what it is. We st so we take a sequence, with the, which is a list of terms that has a definite order, add up all the terms together. The result of that is what we call a series. So the notation would be something like sigma and of the list of a n's. So we can, it depends on where we want to start. If we start at zero, for example, to infinity. So that just means take plug in 0, so you get a0, plus plug in 1, you get a1, plus plug in 2, you get a2, and so on and so forth. This is an infinite series. Right? Why? Because I'm adding up an infinite number of terms. We also have, <coughs> I can say n goes from 0 up to, say, 5 of a n. And so that's a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4 plus a5. And this is an um, example of a finite series. So that's all a series is. We just take some sequence and we add up all its terms. This is the shorthand notation for it. Um, We will write, sometimes I just get sloppy and just write sigma a n if understood what the limits are or we want to say something in general. Right, so there are times when the limits, these are called the limits on our series, are important. But if I want to say something general about series in general, I might just write this down and not put any limits on it. Or unless it's understood. So if in the first part of a problem I define the series this way, and I just might get sloppy and just write it without these things on it for the rest of the problem, that's okay in general. I won't really worry about it. But that's basically what a series is. Um, so now, Finite series are no problem, right? <laughs> right? That's just, it's just okay. I have all these terms. There's a finite number of them. Just add them up, right? You know how to do that. It's arithmetic, essentially. Um, but when you talk about infinite series, things can get weird. There are a bunch of things that happen when you start adding up an infinite number of terms that can be very counterintuitive, that can be very strange, but nonetheless it's very important, at least theoretically, to be able to do this, and we will talk about some of them. For example, um, but these are important to figure out. Um, one example uh, don't forget a definite integral is an infinite series right remember when you were doing top one and you were talking about what a definite integral means you were finding the area <coughs> or curve the goal the trick was erect a bunch of rectangles under that curve let the number of rectangles go off to infinity, and we add up all these things, and the answer was our integral. So this guy, 
what we've been doing the whole time, integration, if you're looking at a definite integral, it's actually an infinite series. You're adding up an infinite number of areas of rectangles, right? So it was a very important thing for us to be able to do to figure out, solve the area problem, right? So there are times, infinite series, they can be strange, but there are contexts in which it's very important for us to be able to do it, right? So a definite integral is an infinite series. Don't forget, it's an infinite Riemann sum. So that alone should be justification enough to you why it's important for us to figure these things out. So, and it's important for something even higher than finding a particular integral. Adding up an infinite number of things is important in many other ways as well. But this is one example that we can all appreciate. An inter a definite integral is an infinite series. And so, technically, being able to compute an antiderivative is me saying that I can add up an infinite number of things and come up with a finite answer, which is, seems to be counterintuitive. How can you keep adding stuff and somehow not add more than this finite number? Right? So it can get strange, but there are there there is a meaning to this. And if so here's what I want to say as a definition, which is kind of Again, kind of, you can think of the example of this. When we were actually computing this, what we did was we set up a Riemann sum, and what we did was we took a limit as n went to infinity, and theoretically that's how we added up all the terms, we by the limits. So that's what we're going to use here. Um, so the definition. Maybe I just mention a comment first. Um, sometimes. A series, in particular an infinite series, sums up, and I have to put that in quotation because what does it mean to sum up an infinite number of things? Sums up to a finite number. In this case, we say the series converges. Series is said to diverge otherwise. So I was like in the bonus problem where I was asking, determine whether these series converge or diverge. So this is kind of what I mean. If you can add up an infinite amount of terms and you theoretically can come up with some finite answer, we say that is the value of the series. And if a series converges to S, we may write the series equals s, meaning there's some finite value that these things add up to. And we can just say that's equal, this series is equal to that. And here's a definition. this be a series. The nth partial sum, I'm defining that term, the nth partial sum of the series is the sum of the first n terms. So, Example, the third partial sum of this is just going to be a zero plus a plus a two. Or right, let me put one here just so it's not confusing. One, two, three. All right, so this is called a partial sum. We use S sub n to denote the nth partial sum. So 
also not. For an infinite series, it will have, for any integer, for any positive integer, it will have a partial sum. It will have an S1, an S2, an S3, an S4, an S5. You can talk about adding up the nth partial sums, and you can do this separately for each one. Yeah? Is there a reason why you wrote n equals 1 instead of n equals 0? No, no So this just really identifies the starting point, which is the first value that you're plugging into this formula. Um, So I'll talk about some nuances for, from where we start in a little bit. But. So let me give you an example. For example, um, if we consider the series 1 over 2 to the n, I believe it's the one I wanted to consider. from n equals 1 to infinity, I can say S1 is just the sum of the first term. So I plug in 1 here, that's a half. And I can say S2 is the sum of the first two terms. That would be a half plus a quarter. And I can talk about S3, which is the sum of the first three terms, that's a half plus a quarter plus an eighth. And you can continue in this fashion, and then I can say Sn is going to be a half plus a quarter plus all the way down to 1 over 2 to the n. Right? So these are called the partial sums. Here's pretty much 99% of the reason why I even, we even did sequences in the first place. The partial sums form a sequence. Right? I can talk about the sequence of partial sums. This will be a list of numbers in a definite order. There is some pattern to how I obtain these numbers. Namely, the pattern is keep adding one more term to this according to this formula, and that gives me the next term. Okay? Definition. We say a series A n converges to S if the limit of its partial sums equals s. Now that is what we will take to mean. I add up an infinite number of terms and this is the answer. That's what it means. If I look at the sequence of partial sums, if I keep adding one more, one more, one more, and I create just a sum of terms, eventually if this sum of terms stop growing, and it converges to some <coughs> number, I can say adding up these infinite number of terms is that number. And that's how we define and write, I can write the series equals s at that point. Okay. Yes? Is that like the limit as n goes to infinity, or? Yes. As I mentioned last time, I might be sloppy with this, but when I'm talking about sequences, it's always the infinite limit. Like, it doesn't really make sense to talk about a finite limit, a limit at a finite number of a sequence. Because you won't be able to arbitrarily get close to something. You're, you're, they're always one integer apart if you were to graph them. So you can't really approach something. Only the, as you go off to infinity, you can approach something. Um, so that's what it will mean. So that is our definition. So you might say, how can we add up an infinite number of terms? This is, this is 
basically how you would do it. So, um, for example, I think yeah, I, I use this same example here. Example. We can show, and the shortcut of the answer is this is actually a geometric series. So that's how you would show. Um, we can show that S n is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 over 2 to the n for this series. Which means, if I take the limit of S n, this is just the limit of 2 to the n minus 1 over 2 to the n, which is equal to Now, of course, you can just say the minus 1 doesn't matter if we're going to infinity, so you can essentially ignore it. You could also apply locals, or you can do a bunch of things, but it should be easy for you to just see right away it's 1, because the biggest guys in the top and bottom is 2 to the n. That minus 1 is not going to matter. Um, so this means if I take the sum of all these terms, the answer is actually 1. It will add up to 1. If I had a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth plus one thirty second plus one sixty fourth ad infinitum, it will add up to one. <laughs> Which is seems surprising, but that's that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. Wait, to infinity equals one? No. If I take this plus that plus that plus that plus that plus forever, that's equal to one. Um, yeah? I'm still a little confused. How come if you have a finite series you said you can't approach something? But if you go to infinity you said you can't approach something. If you have a like finite that, Is that just like as you get farther and farther out and you try to approach something, like that's when you can take the limit? No, I mean, if you're looking at, if you were to draw a picture of a sequence, right? It'll, it'll literally only has values for integers. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right? So you can have a value here, and a value here, and a value here, and a value here, and a value here. Right? But when you're taking a limit, what are you talking about? The limit as you approach this from the left and the right. How are you going to approach it if there's nothing to the left and the right? It's an isolated point. There is no left and right of any singular point. Okay? But if you're talking about there's a pattern that all these guys like converge somewhere, right? There comes a point where I can't approach any individual point. So I can't just say the limit as x as n approaches two, because there is it's never going to exist for any individual point. But if I look at it as a whole and look at just analyze the y values themselves, right? These guys can get arbitrarily close to each other but the x's can't. Okay. So I can talk about the limit overall of all the y values while I can't take the limit for a particular x value, essentially, because there is no, I can't approach any individual point from the left or the right. There's a gap between all the points. So if you're plotting a sequence, it makes no sense to say the limit at a certain point. You can only talk about the limit overall as you approach infinity, because only the y values can potentially get arbitrarily close. The x values can't. Right. So in other words, um, if I start at this point and I move by, I don't know if I want to use feet or meters, but let, let's say <coughs> I start, stand right here, and I move a half a foot, then I move a quarter of a foot, then I move an eighth of a foot, then I move a sixteenth of a foot. If I continue that forever, I would only cover one, one foot. <laughs> it's another way I can say this. <laughs> you wouldn't, you would never. Eventually, the, you, in theory, what you can think about, even though this isn't, isn't absolutely true, is that eventually, these guys get so small 
that adding more of them makes no difference. There comes a point where you'll never get bigger than one because these guys get so small, it's like, ugh. Which, there are problems to thinking about things that way because there are cases in which that sort of thinking won't work. But you might hear people refer to things like that way. But yeah, so this is what it means. Infinite sums are just an summing an infinite number of the terms of a sequence. Every now and then we can talk about what it means for a series to converge. And what that means is if we take the sequence of partial sums, that sequence converges. And we take that to be the sum of the infinite terms. And that is our definition for what it means for this to make sense. This makes sense if and only if, when I write the sequence of partial sums, they converge to that number. Otherwise, diverges. And this is true for every Riemann sum that you've ever taken that converges to an integral. Right? The Riemann sum for, if you, if you take f of x equals x squared, and then you compute the limit as n approaches infinity of f of x to the n times delta x, from n goes from 0 to, to big N, right? So I'm using n subintervals. What that means is if I looked at this as a bunch of partial sums, they would converge to the antiderivative evaluated between the points. It will give you that number, right? And theoretically, that's kind of what was happening with the Riemann sums. I mean, they didn't tell you about that in, in Calc 1, but that's what was happening. Right? This made sense as an answer because of that reason. They realized that if we keep adding a bunch of terms, eventually the answer is not going to change. That's the area. Is big n the same constant? Hmm? Sorry, was big n on top there like a constant? Yeah, it's okay. a constant. Because okay. what you did is you break it up into big n number of rectangles, okay. and then you let that go off to infinity. So theoretically, that's the most important idea. Figuring out when this happens, though, can be very difficult. Um, because to be able to figure out that the sequence of partial sums would look like this, and so you can take the limit of 9. In general, that's not going to be a very nice thing to figure out. <laughs> this happens to be what we call a geometric sequence. It's a very understood sequence. And that's why it follows a very nice pattern where you can really see the answers. Right? So this guy looks like. 1 times 1 half to the n, which I defined in the test frame. This is like the a times r to the n, right? So this looks like your a times r to the n. And basically what that is, is that would look like a plus a times r plus a times r squared plus da da da. And if you assume this converges to some number, what you do is you can multiply that number by r. And so over here, you'd have a r plus da da da. And then you subtract them. All the terms would cancel except the a. And then you can move it over the other side. So this happens to be a nice thing. It's a very nice thing to have this kind of pattern. But you won't always have this kind of pattern. Sometimes you can have very ugly things. Ugly. I mean, no function is ugly. They're all beautiful. But, but sometimes you can have very things that are, they don't fit well with your algebra. And so it's very difficult in doing this in general. And so we need to figure out other ways of adding things together and other patterns of knowing when things will converge. And that's kind of the point of sections 9.2 through 9.4. And that's the point of me giving you this handout. Right? So the handout that I gave you guys last time, that gives you a table that talks about how we can know whether a sequence will add up to a certain number um, based on some criteria. So there is some theory behind all of these things, but we're not going to look into that theory. We're actually just going to use, we're going to assume that table knows what it's talking about, and then we'll use it to figure things out. Um, before that, some important definitions. series AN 
is said to converge absolutely if the series, if you put every term in absolute values, converges. So on the test when I said, determine if something converges absolutely, what I'm asking is, if I put absolute values around each individual term, would that converge? Right? And you can remember, basically what this means is, put a1 in absolute values, a2 in absolute values, a3 in absolute values, add those all together, do they actually converge to a number? Would the sequence of partial sums of those guys converge? That's when it converges. Absolutely converges. Absolutely. absolutely. Does it converge? Absolutely. Okay. There's another definition. If a series converges, but it does not converge absolutely, because that's possible, right? It's possible for this guy to converge, but that guy doesn't. So, for example, this guy might have negative terms, and so it's adding up a bunch of things, but there are other things decreasing it at the same time, because when you're adding it, they're subtracting from the answer. And so that can make it. At, at sum up to something, but if you think of everyone as positive, you don't have all those negatives undoing the buildup, so it can go off to infinity. So it's possible for this guy to converge, but that guy won't, right? And when you, such a thing happens, we say the series converges conditionally. If, if a n converges, meaning I can find an answer to it, but this does not converge. And by the way, for an example of this, you can actually see the bonus problem on the practice for test three. Right? I gave you two series that one converge and one diverge, and you'll notice that one was just like the other, except I alternated the signs. So I did a plus and a minus and a plus and a minus. Turns out, with that, it converged. But if I put everyone plus, it doesn't. Um, but, so if this converges, but this does not converge, we say this series converges conditionally. So it converges on the condition that we keep all the signs the same. Now you can probably start to see the use of that theorem that I gave you last time that says if the limit of the absolute value of something equals zero, then the limit of the original thing equals zero. It's because we're, we're, it's one of the things we want to use to examine this case. I don't know if I told you about the rearrangement thing. In this Partial sums, talk about absolute conditional convergence, um, I mean, I was, was going to make sure the property of summations, but I think you guys would know that. You know that if you're adding up a bunch of terms, then properties. Um, so things like and there's a lot of things to say to this, but I feel like you guys have, have seen this in Calc 1 before as well. So if I have a constant times a sequence, then that's just a constant times the sum of the original sequence. That should be clear. Um, this, if I take two lists and I'm adding them together and then I take the sum of the summation of that, it's the same as adding them the summa summations individually. So things like that you can take advantage of whenever it's possible. Um, it doesn't work for powers because, you know, if you raise a sum to a power, it's not the same as raising each individual term to a power. That's a blasphemy. Um, what else do I need to tell you before we move on? I want to jump into the table, but I want to make sure we have all the tools.
maybe I'll mention something first before we do this. Why do we care about absolute convergence versus conditional convergence? Because it it might seem to you like this is just an unnecessary thing. It's just this is just your math teacher coming with up with something just to mess with you for no reason. There's actually a very important reason of knowing when a series can seek series converges in absolute, with the terms in absolute values versus when it doesn't, it actually has some far-reaching consequences. Um, there's something called the re rearrangement theorem, Riemann's rearrangement theorem. That's the same guy that came up with Riemann sums, which is why you all have to be in public doing Riemann sums now. I think in that same paper where he developed the Riemann sum, he also had this theorem. And he said it kind of like as an afterthought. It was like in one page of that entire paper, which was like 50-some pages or something like that. He mentioned this kind of theorem. Oh, by the way, this is kind of <laughs> And it was, it's something that's actually very surprising. So here's the thing. Suppose a n converges conditionally then for any real number c it is possible to rearrange the terms of this so that they sum to C. It is also possible He never said it like this, but I'm, I'm really kind of just spelling it out. To rearrange the terms to sum to plus or minus infinity, or no limit at all. So here's the why it's important. If a series converges conditionally, does not converge absolutely, it means you can take that sum, you can rearrange the terms, and get it to add up to literally anything you want it to add up to. The sum will actually change values, and you can make it change value to any value you choose. You can also rearrange the terms so that it diverges. Right? So this is something that's not very intuitive. If you have a finite sum, that's not true. You add 1 plus 2 plus 3, it's the same as adding 3 plus 2 plus 1, it's the same as adding 2 plus 1 plus 3. You can rearrange the terms in a sum all you want. When it's finite, you'll always get the same answer. Turns out when you're dealing with infinite sums, this is not true. If something converges only conditionally, it's possible for you to rearrange the terms and get any answer you want. Right? So if you're dealing with any situation where the order of your terms matters, a conditionally convergent series will mess things up. In particular, if I'm integrating the terms of a series, we know that the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. But if the sum itself can change value, the integral has no value, right? So that's kind of weird, and that's kind of why we care. It turns out absolutely convergent sequences are the only ones that no matter how you rearrange their terms, they will always add up to the same value. If it's conditionally convergent, this is not true. You can actually change the value by rearranging the terms. And that's Riemann's rearrangement theory. So this is kind of why we care. So the absolute convergence series, these are the gold standard of absolute convergence series. These are the guys we like because they never mess up even if we start reordering their terms and doing stuff with them. These guys will mess up. 
they will let you down if you try to mess up the order in which they appear, right? So you putting an A1 in front of an A2 can totally make this, like, not have an answer anymore, right? Which is, it's weird, but it's true. And he actually proves it. And there are examples where they prove things like that. So I'm, I'm not going to get into it, but that's just something you should be aware of. Right? Condition converging series can actually change answers if you rearrange their terms. This will never happen to an absolutely convergent series. And that's kind of why we care. Knowing that something converges absolutely is going to be super important. And anything that we want to use in some other math theorem that involves an infinite series, knowing whether that's absolutely convergent will matter because it tells you what you're allowed to do. Um, it tells you if you can rearrange things or not. So let's start with an example. Telescoping series. So this is in your list at the bottom where I mentioned we're, we're going to do an example of this in class, but it's not really in that table because it's sort of hard to define in a nice little package in a table. So we're going to talk about telescoping series. Essentially, what this, this is, it's a sum of terms that has this behavior. An infinite number of the terms will cancel each other out. And so you really end up adding sort of like a, a manageable amount at any given time. Right? And such a series is called a telescoping series. So let's give you an example of that. We're actually going to find the answer. It's easy to figure out Sn because most terms cancel themselves out. And hence, you can find the series. So given that This guy is a telescoping series. Find its sum. There are not a lot of series for which we can easily find the sum, so usually when we find one, we give it a name. Just, I like you, you're one of my favorites. So you name it. So there's a geometric sequence. Series, that's one we know how to find the answer of very nicely. And a telescoping series is another kind of series that we can actually find the exact value. Now, there are times when we can know something will add up to some value, but we can't really find that value. Um, we can approximate it, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But for telescoping series, we can actually find the exact answer. And how, you might ask, is we're going to use our old friend partial fraction decomp. <laughs> so here's what we're going to say. Note, this guy here is equal to basically, I'm going to look now at the limit of the sequence of partial sums. So only out of the first n terms, and then consider that to be the sum. Right? Which that that's literally by definition. Now we're going to focus on this guy. And hopefully I have enough space here. This is equal to the limit as being n approaches infinity of a series of. So the idea now is, I'm going to actually write this guy here in partial fractions decomp. Right? So if I put that as an n and an n plus 1, what are the numerators here? Yeah, but you can actually tell me them right away. Remember, this is the case where the factors are all linear. 
Negative. So the numerator of n would be? Of course, n equals 0 makes the denominator 0. So you go over here, you cover up the n, you plug in n equals 0, and you get 1. n equals minus 1 makes this 0. So you go over here, cover that up, and plug in n equals minus 1. So you get minus 1. So that is the partial fraction of the comp of that guy. So this is basically. Now what you do is you start writing out some of these terms until you start to see a pattern forming. So you plug in n equals 1. That would give you 1 minus a half plus n equals 2, a half minus a third plus n equals 3, a third minus a fourth plus n equals 4, a fourth minus a fifth plus and I think you can kind of see what's happening here. But let's write off the last few terms. Plus, let's say we're at the n minus 2 terms. It's this minus that. Plus the n minus 1 term. It's this minus that. Plus, finally, the nth term is this minus that. So here's where n equals 1, here's where n equals 2, here's where n equals 3, here's where n equals 4, and I'm adding these all up. Here's where n equals big N minus 2, here's where n equals big N minus 1, and here's where our little n equals big N. Right? So that's the final term in the sequence of partial sums. And now what do you notice happening? Minus a half plus a half, we kill each other. Minus a third plus a third, minus a fourth plus a fourth. Minus a fifth is going to cancel the very next guy, which would be one fifth. <coughs> if you go back here, you realize that this would cancel with that, this would cancel with that, and this guy would cancel with the guy that came right before that. So literally, everyone in the middle cancels out except the first guy and the last guy. So this literally becomes. 1 minus 1 over n plus 1. And so that is a formula for your Sn. The sum of the first n terms will have that formula. And so now I can just take the limit. And it's 1. I.e. If I add up an infinite number of terms that have this value, the answer is 1, again. So that's a special case that's called a telescoping series, or a telescoping sum. Basically, it's a series in which you can figure out the nth partial sum by doing a little algebra, and it turns out that literally only a few guys would be left over because everyone else would cancel themselves. And so you get a nice little formula for your nth partial sum that you can take a limit of. Um, again, not all series will have that behavior, but it's, it's a nice one. That whenever it does show up, we can actually use that to our advantage. here till 9.4. We'll use the handout. So you can um, look at the handout. The first thing we're going to talk about is called the test for divergence. AKA kth term test a.k.a. nth term test. 
based on what your what variable you're using. AKA, sorry if I'm unofficial, AKA, the first thing you would check when facing a random series. Kind of like if you're faced with a random integral, there's like a, a method that you go through. Does a basic rule work? No. Can I use substitution? No. Can then, right? You, there's an order that you build up from an easy technique to the most, more sophisticated techniques. When it comes to series, this is the easiest one to actually apply because it actually involves something that you should be good at at this point, just taking a limit. It turns out that if the limit as n approaches infinity of a n is not zero, then the series of a n diverges. So you can tell when, when your series will not have an answer. It will not add up to a nice value. And that happens when if I take the limit of its individual terms, they do not go to zero. Right? And you can kind of think what this would mean. Let's say this was a half. It means as I go to infinity, and I'm keeping adding terms, I'm literally adding at least a half all the time. That's going to add up to a huge number eventually. It has to be the case that eventually the guys that are way out at infinity, they're so small, they're like adding zero. That's literally the only way that the sum could possibly have any answer. Um, so it turns out if the limit is not zero, then this diverges. Warning. Converse is not true. Technically, that's not the converse. But let me say this. If the limit is zero, it does not mean it dies. The series of 1 over n from n goes from 1 to infinity actually diverges, despite the fact that the limit is 0. So you can apply this test that the limit is 0, but if it's not 0, you can say for sure that the series diverges. If it is 0, you can't say anything for sure. You have to actually use, do some further test. But it's, it's a nice thing to check in the, in the beginning. So for example, a bunch of examples here. Uh, the series n equals 1 to infinity of n to the n over n factorial. So if you see that, what you do is note the limit as n approaches infinity of n to the n over n factorial is equal to infinity, which is not 0. This means that guy does not converge. And we're done. That's literally all you have to say. Given a random series, it might look scary, but it, has, it happens to have terms that you actually can know what the limit is very easily. Just check the limit. As long as it's not zero, it, it won't. Right? We can look at something like another example. Here, if you take the limit as n approaches infinity of sine n, you do not get zero.
and uh, there are multitude of examples. You pick a random thing. I think I gave specific examples, but those will do. So here's one that's slightly. One more example of this. But I, I think I illustrated the point. Once you have this something where the limit does not go to zero, you know it will not converge. So if you talk about something like n goes from one to infinity, uh, squared plus one, and I'm talking about five minus seven n plus three n seventh. Let's make that even acute. This be nice. What you can do is note if I take the limit as n approaches infinity of this guy, what is that limit? Three. It's three. In particular, it's not zero. It means that the terms way off in the tail, they're at least, they're around <coughs> as big as three. So if I keep adding them, I'm not going to stop at a number. Which means the series diverges. All right, so this is the easiest one to check, which is probably why it's going to be the first one you always check. Right? Just face with a random series, I ask you, does this converge or does this diverge? You can literally check the limit, is the first thing. As long as it's not zero, it diverges. You don't have to do anything else. If it is zero, though, you might have to do other things, but we will do that next time. So you guys can kind of sort of look through the table for next time, and we'll do some more examples of this, and then talk about some other things. Do we have one?